Hello and welcome back to second chapter. What? Where? Trails in the Sky the Third, how'd you get in here, you wild rascal, you? Actually, the reason we're in the third is because on this bookshelf is the entirety of Gamble Jack. And it just turns out that uh, for recording and editing purposes, it's actually a bit more convenient to do it in here than it is in second chapter. And uh, it doesn't matter too much. The text is completely identical. They're exactly the same. So why not? I will read it in here. It'll be kind of like the same format in which the uh, the read-through of The Doll Knight was read. So that allows it to uh, be a little bit easier on me. So Gambler Jack, I've never read it before. I have put off doing it until now. and uh, But I know a little bit. I know a little bit about its setting. I've gotten a bit of a whiff of it before, so I know what to expect. But I am greatly looking forward to it. Because it is set in the Calvard Republic. And uh, knowing the Trail series and the way things always tie in eventually, there's a decent chance that uh, some of the topics and characters in Gambler Jack could be uh, important later down the line. Or maybe not, I don't know. As of 2018, the Calvard Arc doesn't exist just yet. But, uh, you know, knowing Falcom, there's probably going to be a decent amount of good stuff in there that could be tied into many, many years later. So let's dive into it. In actuality, it turns out the text isn't completely identical because there's actually like a typo on the very first page of the first chapter. What the heck, Hexseed? Chapter 1, The Girl. The Calvert Republic. There's a city in this country, a place where migrants from the east have recreated their homeland down to the bright lacquered tiles. Nicknamed the Eastern Quarter, it's a vibrant place, bustling and hot. Orbal buses trundle down the main street lined with stands of fragrant eastern cooking as the welcoming cries of sellers rise and fall over a crowd of travelers from every nation. See that there's a bit of a mistake there in the last two lines. The place where the cultures of the East and West meet. Yes, it was a place that wore that mantle well. On the northern outskirts of that town was a little rundown bar. Dallas it had been presentable once, but now the plaster was crumbling and what doors were left barely fit their pitted frames. Of course, such a seedy place attracted the clientele to match. To the lawless and violent, it was home. Hm. Sorry, looks like my win again, muttered a low voice that echoed through the grimy room. The voice belonged to Jack. He was of medium size and in his early thirties, a man in his prime. The frayed shirt he wore had seen better days, but the accessories adorning his body were of obvious worth. Much like the brilliant blue of his eyes, none of them quite fit someone like him. Compared to the dirty, poor, and desperate thugs around him, he looked out of place. Jack was always to be found at that bar, gambling or sharing around with the dregs of the town. Sometimes fighting, sometimes drinking, he passed his days in idle recreation. As usual, today found him hunched at the bar. He'd been deep in his cup since early noon. It was the same as always, a day set to be just like all the others was stretching out before him. And into that familiar scene cut the shriek of the door opening. A new customer stepped into that same old bar. But who was this new arrival? It was a girl, unlike any other he had seen before. Chapter 2. The Offer The girl strode into the bar and closed the door without turning a wrench. There was no hesitation in her manner. Clearly her arrival was not happenstance. Her face was determined, but her confident entrance couldn't erase the lingering innocence of youth. Even the best liar wouldn't try and claim she was more than 18. Dark brown eyes and hair suggested she was Eastern, but her nose and features made it hard to be sure. The girl slowly walked forward. With each step, her cute little knees peeked out from under the trim of her skirt. Her outfit was designed without any sense of decoration. It seemed her taste lay more along the lines of utility than style. Maybe because of that, the Eastern symbol necklace on her chest couldn't help but look equally unremarkable. The lack of volume in that area probably had something to do with that as well. It would still be some time before she really bloomed, so to speak. An appearance bearing the signs of East and West both, and simple, unembellished clothes. The girl might have been the spirit of the Eastern Quarter made flesh. She caught the eye of one of the punks hanging around almost instantly. <laughs> hey, little girly, he slurred. Wanna have some fun with me? As he spoke, he grabbed the girl's wrist with one greasy hand. It happened in an instant. Her arm flew up, dislodging the punk's grip. Now freed, her hand disappeared deep into her skirt and then slid out with a mass of gleaming black iron. She pressed it to the space between his eyes. 
He stared at the object for a moment before collapsing to his knees in fear. It was an orbital gun of cunning make, a high caliber Vern Company model. If she'd shot that firearm, the punk would have lost his head instead of his bladder. Needless to say, it was not your average self-defense weapon. It's the latest model, she purred. Want to see what it can do? She was cool and calm, the barrel of the gun never wavering. Were she to fire, her aim would be perfect. Overwhelmed by the girl, gun, or perhaps both, the punk couldn't move a muscle. Everyone else in the bar remained frozen as well. All eyes were on the girl. Hey, miss. Hate to ask you, but could you let him off with that? Maybe the speaker couldn't stand it anymore, or maybe it was disturbing his drink. But the husky's sensual voice broke through the silence. It was Jack. Still planted firmly in his chair, breath smelling of liquor, he continued. I'm sure he's very sorry, and he's learned his lesson. As if in answer to it, the punk started nodding his head vigorously. I've come here to gamble, the girl replied abruptly. She slowly lowered the gun in her left hand. Her expression continued to remain cool and detached. Sounds good. Come over here. Give me everything you got. Jack's words had an immediate impact. Not on the girl, but on the gathered goons and hoods. They all shared a glance, each and every one of them, with the dirtiest grin you could imagine. Chapter 3. Challenge at High Noon Jack and the girl moved over to a table in the back. Unlike the other pitted and sticky furniture, this table was smooth and polished to a shine and seemed meant for gambling. Without a word, both took their seats. Jack sat against the wall and the girl faced him straight on. The other patrons were captivated, helplessly fascinated by the match. They snuck glances at the pair, ears straining to listen in. The bar filled with a fidgety silence. The girl's game of choice was poker. Jack accepted wordlessly. After a brief exchange to confirm the terms of the challenge, they settled on bets. It was to be 100 Mira a hand, not even enough to buy a beer, but Jack considered that fair for a match against a kid and said as much. The dealer was the small fry punk from before. Jack gave him a quick eye signal. First hand. Both discarded just one card. Jack called and the girl stood. Jack had two pairs. The girl had just one. Jack was the winner. <laughs> Sorry, little missy, he drawled. He raised his glass to her and downed the amber liquid in a single decisive gulp. Second hand. Both discarded just one card. Perhaps trying to look confident, Jack let out a big clear sigh. The girl called and Jack stood. The girl had two pairs, Jack had the same. But the cards told the tale. The girl's hand had the high card. It was her win. What? Jack exclaimed. His hand that had been toying with the glass froze. Immediately he glanced over at the punk who was dealing. The other man avoided his gaze. Something wrong, the girl asked. Her face betrayed nothing. N no, forget it. He shakily responded. Had she swept out some guards? The girl had suddenly taken on a whole new angle. The look on Jack's face changed instantly. Lightly clearing his throat, Jack put the glass back on the table with his left hand. Then, once more, he cleared his throat. The dealer, recognizing the signal, picked up the cards again. It was their code for deal normally next round. Third hand, as expected, each discarded just one card. Jack called and the girl stood. Jack's hand was a full house. <laughs> How about that, he crowed. With a flourish, Jack laid his cards on the table. The bar patron snickered into their cups. The girl set down her cards without a word. Four sevens. It was the girl's win. The bar once again returned to silence. Chapter 4. The Daughter Ultimately, it was the girl's win. The silence in the bar was punctuated only by the sound of a raucous argument out on the street. <laughs> Holding back the laughter bubbling up, Jack asked the girl a question. Hey, Missy, where oh where did you learn to be this good? The girl made no reply. Instead, she took the cards into her hands and began shuffling. They flew back and forth with exquisite grace between her long, slender fingers. She dealt five to Jack, then five to herself. Show them, she demanded, and Jack obliged, hesitantly turning over the cards. His hand was four jacks. Her hand was four kings. You're... you're kidding me! Jack was nearly speechless by the sight, to which she only said, Jack doesn't beat king. At the word king, murmurs rippled through the bar. King. It was the handle of a legendary gambler said to be the best in the Republic until his death. The card technique the girl had shown was one of the ones the king had been fond of using when he felt like teasing Jack. Who? 
just who are you? Jack asked the girl. She gave him a long, bitterly cold glare at the question, as if it were both stupid and one she'd been dying to answer. You probably don't know me, but I know you very well, she spat. Hello, Victory Jack. My name is Hal. I'm the daughter of King, who you killed. Your King's daughter? Jack had never met King's daughter, not in person, no. But nonetheless, he did have memories of her. King had been a doting father that had drilled holes in Jack's ears with endless stories about her. I see. So King's daughter has come to kill me, huh? The atmosphere in the bar was suddenly charged. Alright then, kill me. The words casually left Jack's mouth. It was a line no one in the bar had ever expected. He tapped his chest. The heart's here. Make sure you aim well. The girl, how? Quietly drew her orbital gun. Her aim, of course, was Jack's heart. Chapter 5, The Invitation Hal's fingers sought out the trigger of her gun. There wasn't a man in this bar who could find the courage to stop her. The punks and hoods just cowered, whispering from their seats. Shut up, all ya! Jack shouted over the buzz. The chatter in the bar stilled. Grinding his back teeth, Jack looked straight into the girl's eyes. That's right, my goal is revenge, she seethed. But, it won't mean anything like this. Hal lowered her gun. As Jack watched the barrel of the gun slide away from his chest, confusion creased his face. Hal continued talking. Over these last three years, I've spent blood, sweat, and tears to learn to be as good as I am. With that, the girl threw a card in Jack's face. It was some kind of invitation. I have a stage that's better suited to settling this all ready for us, she said, never giving Jack a moment to protest. We'll finish our match there. It'll be one of the poker matches you love oh so dearly. And I swear, I'll make sure you eat your full share of misery and bitterness after the slop you forced my father to swallow. With her threat lingering in the air, Hal disappeared. Unable to grasp the meaning in the girl's words, Jack just sat there for a while. Finally, he picked up the card that had fallen to the floor and read the text printed on it. Tomorrow night at 10, come to the harbor. The harbor? Huh. It can't be. A sense of foreboding ran through the back of Jack's mind. As he was about to crush the card in his hand, a small signature on the back caught his eye. Enrique. The penmanship was familiar, as was the name. Oh man. Jack's sense of foreboding would prove right. Chapter 6. King. On the night after the day Hal visited, Jack headed to the harbor as the card instructed. In a rare show of sobriety, he hadn't had a drop of booze. He realized at some point that he was being followed. Just as well, he knew it was someone acting on behalf of Enrique. Don't worry, he yelled as he stopped and turned. I ain't gonna run or hide from this. No one answered. Tch, what a boring fellow you are. Turning back around, Jack continued on. That night was a dark one, with neither moonlight nor a single star piercing the cloud-shrouded sky. Jack only had the road lamps to guide him as he meandered through the empty streets. As he did... Memories of the grand match between him and King flooded back. King's legendary skills had earned him his nickname to match. He had been both Jack's teacher and his greatest rival. Seven years ago, Jack and King had played the game of their lives. It was Jack who found himself the winner. Their game was used by the privileged in the underworld of the Republic to decide the outcome of a struggle for power. King, forced to take responsibility for losing, was killed. Though indirect, it could not be denied that Jack's win had been King's ultimate loss. Around an hour after leaving the bar, he reached the harbor. The smell of refuse and brine wafted in on a warm breeze. An enormous boat was floating on the dark night sea just ahead, waves lapping quietly at its sides. Its hull was painted a solid black, making it almost impossible to see. It was the same boat Jack and King had been on for that final fateful game. As Jack approached the gangway, he was met by a small silhouette from the shadows. How? Welcome, Victory Jack, she said. I really didn't think you would come all the way out here on your own two feet. <laughs> I have to admit, you've got courage. Normally, Jack might have had a joke or a comeback, but tonight alone he was a different man. Glancing at Hal, he boarded the ship without a word. The light from the portal shone blue, glinting off his eyes as he passed. The sound of the steam whistle was swallowed by the lonely darkness, and slowly, the ship slipped free from the harbor and out to sea. Chapter 7, 
the banquet of darkness. The ship was utterly silent as it cut through the velvety darkness of the night. In contrast to the stillness and inky black of the outside, one layer down the ship's interior was filled with light and sound. Furnishings from every part of the continent adorned the walls, and a band of musicians played a cheery song. The orbal glow of a chandelier imported from Le Burl shone down on every form of human desire. In the hall built at the center of the ship, guests laughed and chatted. They appeared to be the finest of ladies and gentlemen, but each and every one were a part of the seedy Republican underworld. They were the type of folk that spoke of murder as easily as one would dinner or a fine wine. Their faces hadn't changed much in seven years. The farthest depths of the hall reserved discreet seating for the highest ranked of the lot, and just like before, there was a certain group of men there. One old man, who was flanked by several bodyguards, stood out in particular, Chief Minister Shamrock. He happened to be the host of the party aboard the ship. A long white beard tailed down his chest. It was his symbol, and also the symbol of power. Though he retired several years before, he continued to serve in an advisory role to many organizations. Retirement had done nothing to slow his influence on the nation. He was a man well worthy of being called the monster of the underworld. Chief Minister Shamrock held this party once every year as a place for the powerful to meet and share useful information. Of course, there were many in the group who could hardly be called friendly in their attitude. Two of these such men were Enrique and Juan. Enrique, both seven years ago and now, was the man behind arranging tax fateful gambling matches. Formerly an arms dealer, he had expanded his dealings to smuggling drugs within the Eastern Quarter a decade prior and never looked back. For that, he became a villain on the rise, the best of the new class. Conversely, Juan was a villain whose roots ran deep in the region back to even before the Eastern Quarter. He was the kind of man who ruled from the top, commanding gangs of thugs, punks, and the like. For as long as the two were in the same business, Enrique and Juan had been locked in a vicious territorial dispute. It was the classic tale of new versus old, and neither side yielded a reg. Every drop of blood in their attempts to claim dominance was only washed away with more blood. However easy it was to wash away, the constant splattering of blood across pavement did little to bring in the mirror for either side. It took three years of profitless violence for Enrique to finally propose a solution. A one-on-one -on -one gambling match between the best of the best. Even cheating was welcome, for it could hardly be called cheating at all if one was never caught in the act. Juan's first instinct was to reject the idea, but even he could see the heavy toll the fighting had taken on his own organization. Truly, the only thing keeping him from agreeing was his old-fashioned stubborn mentality. He was, at his core, a man greatly adverse to change. In order to set his plans in motion, Enrique brought his proposal forward to none other than Chief Minister Shamrock, who also served as advisor to Juan's group. With him having granted the match his blessing, there was little more Juan could do but accept. Chapter 8. Hal The clock chimed the eleventh hour. The match between Jack and Hal was to start at midnight exactly. She waited in the interim in Enrique's room. Your father had become ill and died seven years ago. That's what the girl had heard from her mother, and yet three years ago she learned her father had instead lost his life in a match. Hal didn't have many memories of her father. She'd spent her childhood with her mother. That was exactly why, though, that each and every one was engraved into her heart as irreplaceable treasures. The things she remembered best were the sights and the gambling dens. She didn't often get to go along, but to her, the way her father could silence even the most finely dressed of gentlemen with his near magical card handling was something she admired with all her heart. The last memory Hal had was of him taking her hand while she was in bed and telling her not to worry. Maybe that memory was what kept her from believing what her mother said about her father's death. After all, how could the strong, healthy man from that memory drop dead of illness so suddenly? It was a typical day when she had learned the truth. She was out shopping for her mother, and rather than taking the usual route home, she found herself heading to one of the gambling dens along the back streets on a whim. One fateful whim that was all it took for her to overhear the careless chatter of thugs who spoke of her father. It had been seven years, yes, but it was a match of the ages, a match which still ushered in fervent whispers among the men and women who frequented the dark corners of the gambling world. 
The truth left her with a hatred so all-consuming that she was blind to all but one desire, revenge. Swearing she would become as good as her father, Hal obsessively frequented the gambling dens and played with that one burning desire guiding her hands. It was Enrique who, upon hearing rumors, approached Hal first. He had claimed victory in his first match against Juan by betting on Jack. With Hal, he saw his chance to do so again. Anyone could see that to Hal, participating in such a match could be a perfect means to an end. Cutting all ties with her mother was a sad but necessary sacrifice, and though she was young, she was welcomed as the newest addition to Enrique's group. Being blessed with talent to begin with, and having abandoned all else to focus on improving her craft, it took a mere three years for her to master what King had spent a lifetime studying. Revenge had proven to be an incredible motivator. Hal's eyes were distant as she waited quietly for the match. Perhaps those three years were running through them. Still seated, she bowed her head and let out a big, long sigh. No need to let the weight of this drag you down, you know, Enrique softly said to her. Don't worry, she replied. Now that I'm here, my heart is as light as a feather. Her face betrayed the lie in her words as a flicker of sorrow creased her features. Before anyone could notice, she was back to the same poker face as before. Right now, the only thing on my mind is seeing Jack lose. Enrique's lips contorted into a smile. The more confident he grew in his victory, the more disturbingly warped his smile became. Chapter 9. Nostalgia While Hal sat and contemplated her past, Jack was hunched at the bar counter in the main hall. It was a spot with a full view of the setting for the match to come. He stared at the stage, never once even touching the drink he'd ordered. The same seats, the same colors. The more he looked at it, the more it felt as if the events of seven years ago had happened only yesterday. A voice started Jack from his reverie. How about a drink on me? Without turning, he wordlessly shook his head. Jack didn't need to look through seven-year-old memories to recognize that voice. It was Juan, the very man who had punished King with death. I eagerly await seeing the level of skill that once dethroned a king, Jack. With that, Juan disappeared. Huh, <laughs> a Jack dethroning a king, huh? Jack could only smile bitterly. The clock steadily ticked away. It was 11.50. The match would begin in 10 minutes. The guests had begun to gather in the hall. Every one of them seemed to have been waiting eagerly for this night. Many had money riding on the outcome. Compared to Enrique or Juan's contest, though, they barely had anything to lose. Hal followed Enrique out into the hall. Taking her seat immediately, she sat quietly, eyes straight ahead. If she was bothered by the crowd or the enormity of the event, she gave no sign. After watching Hal take her place, Jack slowly rose from his spot at the bar. Unlike Hal, Jack had a bit of a name, and as he stepped forward, the crowd called out. It brought back memories of his match with King, how nervous and restless he was by the shouts and cheers, how he wanted nothing more than to run away. Jack and Hal were both seated now. The card table in the center of the hall lay between them, the two faced each other, but their gazes never met. In total silence, time passed. Shortly after the two took their seats, a black-garbed man sat in a chair across from them. Just like seven years ago, he was the dealer provided by Chief Minister Shamrock. The dealer pressed the switch below the card table. Slowly, the table area sank into the floor, allowing the guests in the hall a bird's-eye view of the duel. From behind their respective back players, Juan's group and Enrique's group cast intense gazes at the gambler's hands. Farther back, behind it all and watching over everything, was Chief Minister Shamrock. Now then, ladies and gentlemen, tonight we have a revenge match, Enrique yelled, unable to contain his enthusiasm. It had been far too long since the gambling world was given such a high-stakes game. The crowd answered Enrique's introduction with a roar of approval. Chapter 10. The Match Separated by the small card table, the two faced off. Each player had a mountain of chips to wager. Once someone's pile was reduced to nothing, the match would be over. The clock struck midnight, and the silence following the chime, the grand match between Jack and Hal began. At first, the match was totally even. For every hand Jack won, Hal won another. Whenever Hal won a hand, Jack had the next. Neither gave a reg. The ones most surprised by this close contest was Juan and his group. Everyone who had bet on Jack started to jeer and holler. During the match, time and again, Hal spoke to Jack. Using conversation to distract your opponent was all part of the game, but Hal's persistence went beyond just tactics. However, 
Jack never said a single word back to her until roughly 30 minutes passed. Then, finally, he broke the silence at the time with a low, textured voice. Once upon a time, there was a man. It was so soft that the crowd could barely hear, but Jack wasn't speaking for them. He continued. This man had something he admired. He wanted to become the thing he admired, and he wanted to win against the objects of his admiration. And through it all, he was drawn closer to that which he admired. Both laid down their hands. Jack had one pair. Hal had two. Chips moved from Jack's mountain to Hal's. <laughs> what is it, Jack? This is all part of your plan? Hal would occasionally add a sarcastic remark, but Jack just kept on telling the story. The man stole some tricks from that which he admired and practiced his own skills as best as he could. In the end, his efforts eventually made him strong enough that people called him victory. At some point, there was someone who took notice of that reputation. He thought, why not pit the best against each other? There was no show that could be better. Enrique's ears twitched. Something in what Jack was saying bothered him. The man gladly accepted the offer for the show. It was the match of a lifetime with that which he admired most, after all. The man's heart danced with excitement. Back then, that man was a young fool who didn't see the world around him for what it was. Certainly, he'd never have thought about what it would really mean to lose that match. Hal listened intently. At some point, she had started to pay attention to Jack's story. The audience was much the same. Everyone in the hall straightened to hear the tale tumbling from Jack's lips. The two played their cards. Jack had no pair. Hal had a full house. Chips moved from Jack's mountain to Hal's. Chapter 11, The Decisive Moment Jack, Hal chided. You're so busy talking you're forgetting to play the game. Enough. I'll settle things here now. Hal's words reignited the crowd. The silent hall burst into excitement as she pushed every last chip in her pile. Perhaps she was just that confident, but Hal already had a significant lead on Jack. He couldn't possibly accept the bet. Could he? To match my bet, since you seem a little short, how about you wager your life? Hal reached under the table and unholstered her horrible gun, then set both it and a bullet on the table by her chips. If I win, you can kiss your life goodbye. The audience waited for his answer with bated breath. Surely no one would be foolish enough to accept such a bet, they thought. But Jack's response was the opposite of what they were expecting, as well as precisely what they were hoping for. All right. I'll call your bet. Not like it matters. If you don't kill me, someone else will. His response sent a wave of shock through the gambling enthusiasts in the hall, with each and every one of them interrupting into claps and unbridled cheers of approval. Enrique, personally, could not have been more pleased. Juan sat quietly. Whatever he thought of the situation was privy to him and him alone. The stakes were now that much higher, but neither side opted to change out their cards. Rather, they chose to place their current hand face down. So, what happened to the man? Hal asked, seemingly smug with victory. Or possibly she was just asking to hear Jack's final words. The man never won against the one that he admired. Silence followed in the wake of his response, and in that one moment, Hal's unveiling mask shattered to pieces. Her true expression, shown at last in one so beyond her years, was a long, unquenched rage that even Enrique had never seen. What are you talking about? You won, didn't you? Here, in this very hall. Tears flooded Hal's eyes, and her voice buckled. And, and you made a fool of my papa. Perhaps caught in the moment, Jack was as abrupt and impassioned as she was. The texture in his voice thinned as he locked eyes with her and cried. Your father never lost, not to me. He was never made a fool. He never felt a second of misery or humiliation. He... His pride is as intact now as it was seven years ago. He chose to lose in order to protect everything he held so dear to him. Enrique visibly panicked upon Jack's confession, sent his thugs forward to silence Jack before he could say any more. Juan would have no such interruptions, however, and with a snap of his fingers had his own men step forward to prevent any interference. For the first time since the match began, his curiosity was now visibly piqued. The crowd was restless and clamoring for the results. Once Chief Minister Shamrock gave his sign, the dealer flipped both players' cards. Jack had four kings. Hal had four jacks. It was well and truly Jack's victory. The crowd immediately hushed, but mouths were left agape 
and the room was bathed in a silence that was uncomfortably palpable. All eyes were on the table, and all ears were perked, awaiting some kind of reaction. Seconds passed. Finally, Jack was the first to speak. See, Jack muttered. Jack can't beat King. Chapter 12, The Truth The charge battle had closed with Jack's dramatic upset of a victory. Putting aside Jack's words, Juan took a moment to breathe a welcome sigh of relief, but this turn of events was no small victory on his part. Conversely, Enrique sat stunned, his head in his hands. Hal stared blankly at the cards. Her eyes were wide with disbelief. No way. How did you... Four kings? That... That should be my hand. Hearing this, Enrique began to violently object, leaving no excuse unaccounted for. Jack was a cheat, he insisted. The match was a wash. No, Jack was disqualified for breaking the rules. Give it up, Don Enrique, Juan commanded. If you think he's a cheat, then how about you show us, huh? Go on. Show us exactly what it is Jack did. Juan stood resolutely, arms crossed. Cheating's fine as long as you're not caught, he recited. It was a core rule of the match and Enrique knew it. There was nothing he could say back that could lay bare the trick. He stammered over his words as he rushed to nitpick every single one of Jack's actions throughout the match, but it was no use. Impossible. Jack denied it all with a single word. This is a technique King used in his final match. I didn't know it at the time, so there's no way Mr. Enrique could. To make me win and keep you safe, Hal, King used this very trick. Truly, a trick worthy of a king. Head bowed, he continued. I could never understand it. If he had a great trick like this up his sleeve, then what on earth would make him do something dumb like throw away a match? I hated him for that, you know. Hell, I've spent these past seven years consoling myself by drowning in booze. Jack looked up, his eyes catching the sparkle of the chandelier above them just right. But once I saw that invitation of yours, Hal, it started to make sense. Seeing Mr. Enrique's name on the back was all I needed for everything to fall into place. Do you remember, Hal? On the same day as that match, you were in bed after being struck with a very sudden illness. No one could explain what it was. Jack's words had Hal like a fish on a hook. So what? What does that have to do with anything? Jack ignored her and continued. Around the same time, I'd heard a certain rumor about Mr. Enrique. Word was, he'd gotten his hands on a hell of a poison. Something along those lines, anyway. Perhaps Jack wasn't the only one who had heard this rumor. Curious as they were to listen in on Jack's story, a flurry of whispers swept through the audience upon the mention of the poison. The kind of whispers where one couldn't understand word for word what was being said, but any onlooker would know exactly what everyone was thinking. Enrique could only stare at the ground and bite his lip. The facts weren't difficult to piece together. There was Hal, who just so happened to fall ill during the worst of times for King. There was Enrique, who had so conveniently acquired a poison during the best of times for him. And then there was King, who had so blatantly lost against me on purpose, Jack listed. There's an easy way to explain all those things, and it boils down to one simple truth. Juan leapt to his feet, fury writ all over his features. He began screaming at Enrique, You! Seven years ago, you poisoned this girl, and then, then you threatened King with it. Chapter 13, The Sense You poisoned this girl and then threatened King, didn't you? Every word from Juan's mouth was akin to being punched in the gut, blow after blow after blow. Her body could only stiffen. Before Juan's accusations, Enrique desperately scrambled to put a defense together. He tried valiantly to hide how flustered he was, to conceal how sweaty his palms were. But never was there a poorer actor on a stage. Indeed, the way he begged and pleaded his case before such a massive jury was almost humorous. Everyone was quick to believe what Jack was saying. Of course, there was no proof that such a tragedy had occurred at all could easily have been a cleverly arranged string of lies. Yet Enrique's rambles professing his innocence didn't make any sense to them, whereas Jack's story of few words made far too much. In the underworld, betrayal was a constant companion. That was precisely why, however, plain logic trumped proof time and time again. So long as the masses felt your story made the most logical sense, proof, be it present or lacking, didn't mean a damn thing. Enrique knew this rule as well as any other man or woman present. 
as it slowly dawned on him that his punishment was only a matter of when, not if, he ceased his protestations. How merely continued to stand as still as could be. She was being held upright by a throng of emotions, and her mind worked overtime to catch up to each new feeling the revelation of that night had brought. My father never lost, she whispered. The truth was a comforting balm to her heart, but at the same time, it filled her with a deep sense of loss. Her father had chosen death himself. The very thought of it was far too big and far too sad. The flames of revenge that had fueled her action suddenly and utterly went out, and as her once burning drive died, all that remained was the thin smoke and cold white ash where her anger had been. That means that for me, Papa... The feelings that began to well up turned to words, and as they parted from her, everything that had been bubbling up inside surged without. Falling to the floor, Hal curled up in a ball and began to cry like a child. As he glanced at Hal from the corner of his eye, Juan put a hand on Jack's shoulder and patted him in a congratulatory way. Tonight went better than I could have possibly imagined. I'll do anything you ask if it's in my power, he whispered to Jack. Then give me Hal, Jack requested without a moment's hesitation. Juan was hard pressed to answer. No matter how pitiable he found Hal, she was still a pawn of Enrique's. Even if there were to be punishments meted out for the events of seven years ago, her freedom was very much in question. Give Jack what he wants, will it really be such a problem? The voice from behind both of them froze every single person in the hall. All eyes turned to a single point. The one who drew their gaze was the bearded consultant to the underworld, Chief Minister Shamrock. Giving him the girl isn't a problem, is it, Enrique? Enrique nodded weakly. At last, the ship was filled with cries and celebration. Finale. To each their own wish. Jack and Hal returned to the harbor at dawn. The enormous ship disappeared into the morning fog, gone before most knew it was even there, as if they had been played by an illusion all along. What will you do with me then? Hal asked. Nothing. You're free. Jack shrugged nonchalantly. I doubt anyone will ever try to use your life in any deals ever again. Do whatever you wish. Hal was quiet a moment, then asked, Hey Jack, why? Why would you do all this for me? Jack gave her a small, rare smile. King gave his life to keep you safe. Am I saving you? He saved my life as well. I'm only standing here today because of him. Don't you think it's only natural I'd use the life he gave me to make his wish come true? Wish? What do you mean? Jack's smile disappeared. I believe your father regretted setting foot into those gambling dens. Not because of the game, but because there was no way a guy like him would have ever risked putting his daughter in danger for anything. He adored you, you know. You should have never gotten wrapped up in this dark world, Hal. I'm sure he would have wished the same. Hal didn't know what to say. Jack continued. If you get what I'm saying, then run off from here and don't you ever come back. And with that, Jack strode away and left Hal standing there by the sea. The Calvert Republic. There's a city in this country, a place where migrants from the east have recreated their homeland down to the bright lacquer tiles. On the northern outskirts of that city was a little rundown bar. Over a week had passed since that fateful game. Jack could still be found there in that same dingy bar. As always, he was at his liquor starting from noon. He had settled things with his past, but he was still the same man he was before. No, he was changed. He drank less. And when he drank, he didn't throw it back like a man dying of thirst, but instead sipped slowly and appreciated the taste. And that day, once more, the door to the place opened with a sound like a shriek. A new customer stepped into that very same bar. And that new customer was Hal. Jack choked on his whiskey. Hal? What are you doing in here? This ain't the kind of place you should be in. Ignoring his sputtering, she pulled up a stool and gave him her most dazzling smile. Hey Jack, she began, let's play a game, a real shocker of a match. Only this time, all bets are off. And there you have it, that's Gambler Jack. Another fun story in the Trails universe, how much of it is truth, how much of it is fiction, I don't know. But we may just find out someday, knowing Falcom. When we pick up next time, we get back to the main story. We've got a problem to solve in Grand Cell, obviously, and I'll wrap up this chapter very shortly. And uh, actually, I'll let you know right now that uh, if you're keeping up as these go out, then uh, after this uh, current chapter we've been in, we'll actually, uh, the LP will be taking a little bit of a break for about a month, and it'll come back in November. 
and uh, then we'll finish the game. No big deal. I've actually, uh, as this video gets recorded and gets uh, edited and put up, I've actually already finished the game. I finished it a few weeks ago. I said that I'd, I think I said I'd let future me worry about Gambler Jack, and that's what's happened. I've had to come back and uh, make sure I record the Gambler Jack video. But yeah, the game's already done. I've already beaten it, and it's already recorded and set to go. And it'll be finishing sometime in uh, in November. Um, I'll be taking October off to focus on some other things. Uh, as I sit down and record this, I don't know exactly how things are going to work out, but uh, I've, I've got a lot on my plate right now, and I'm trying to like balance things for like months ahead of time and trying to figure out what's going to happen when and balance my little YouTube hobby with like other personal projects I'm working on. So I'll see how the time works out, but whatever. Anyway, that's it for now. See you guys in the next one.